Welcome to the podcast of Man Library's Chats in the Stacks book talk series. Today's talk, originally presented on February 23rd, 2006, is Cheap and Tasteful Dwellings, Design Competitions, and the Convenient Interior by Jan Jennings, Professor of Design and Environmental Analysis. In her most recent book, Professor Jennings examined an unusual facet of American architectural history, a series of house design competitions for architects in the 1879 to 1909 period. The practice lives of ordinary architects who competed in the contests offer a reinterpretation of architectural professionalization. Showcasing winning designs, Professor Jennings also argues that the theory of convenient arrangement was an active architectural practice for middle-class houses and relates Cornell's early efforts in extension to the national development. But, okay, does that sound right? Well, Lisa, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I also want to thank Janet McHugh for suggesting this talk and hosting the event. And Eveline uh, Ferenti, who managed the logistics and the publicity. There are several significant friends and colleagues here today who are acknowledged in the book. As research developed, I discovered a high level of participation of faculty and students at Cornell. A number of coincidences of action about house design and convenient arrangement on both sides of the campus, endowed architecture and statutory home economics is the thread that I'm going to pull out today in this talk. When Carpentry and Building, an American Builders Journal, ran its advertisement in 1879 for designs for cheap houses, it set itself apart from other builders' journals. First, it invited the attention of architects for a competition in plans for cheap dwelling houses costing $1,000 or less. Moreover, the paper chose not to designate any style of architecture, but instead stipulated that house design should be comfortable and convenient. These phrases became the basis for the study. Understanding them required unraveling several paradoxical conditions in architectural history. A cartoon published in Carpentry and Building in 1889 illustrates many last-minute arrivals and mail carriers as Mercury, a messenger of the gods. From 1879 to 1909, Carpentry and Building sponsored 42 competitions, awarded 86 winners, and printed hundreds of competition designs from winners and losers that fostered a national dialogue about good house design. Cumulatively, the designs for dwellings comprise a selective record shaped by the competition's programs. No other trade journal conducted a sequence of dwelling competitions, nor kept the process in play for such a long time, 30 years. No other source left such a comprehensive record of design processes and results, critical comments, drawings, a legacy of designers and their stories and their theoretical stances. Seeing the competition designs as a historical sequence allows us to examine broad patterns within which continuous change occurred in the interior architecture for ordinary houses. The contest also reached to the core of architectural practice in the 1879 to 1909 period. The competitions encourage a close reading of the drawings required. Who, how, and why architects learn to draw and draft becomes an important subplot of the competitions and it offers insight into the state of the profession. Drawings constitute one of the recurrent themes of the book as we consider them as artifacts of design as well as devices that convey social history. The drawings can also be viewed as narrative regarding the manner of working, stories that style cannot tell. Drawings also became one of the means to determine quality of design and to teach the journal's readership criticism. The drawings dismissed as ordinary the stories of their designers and the social, cultural, and theoretical frameworks in which they operated 
provide a record of architectural life. And in this vein, and in the book, I also examine the profession's material culture. For example, Frank Grotevent's cases of drawing instruments are a palpable relic of an architectural age. They could have belonged to any drafter or architect or been misplaced a long time ago. We know this much. He prized his instrument sets for what they represented and his drawings as the tangible products of an architectural life. Cases and drawings passed from him to a great niece to preserve. <clears throat> the cases show much wear from an architect who, with each new commission, locked his cases, shoved them in his valise, and moved on. When or where he bought his sets, how much he paid, or on what basis he chose them is lost. Together, however, they tell a story about their worth. In part one of the book, social history is the lens through which the competitions, the competitors, and architectural culture are viewed. One of the interpretive arguments I made in this section is that the architects who practiced in this transitional time period deserve a better fate than they've received. It is unfair to summarily dismiss this generation out of hand as not having, not possessing adequate education or training to operate professionally. Contemporary architects owe their education, their identity, their professionalism, not only to the big name urban architects, but also to the great majority of those ordinary ones who conducted smaller practices. As this study has attempted to show, the competitors played roles that were neither simple nor inconsequential. In part two of the book, the dwelling designs that the competitions produced are examined in terms of design history and theory. I argue that this story is really about the competitors' attempts to apply an interior architectural theory to houses. Their designs represented experiments. Through design, they and the readership engaged in a learning process in which the goal was to apply an interior theory to inexpensive houses. That was a thesis. And that is how the designers learned to think about the interior, to elevate interior design to the status that an exterior form claimed for centuries. You're looking here at these little uh, pictures at an $800 house. It's a very small house, and the only one I've ever seen for which a section was drawn. The gallery located between parts one and two of the book consists of a front elevation and a floor plan of all of the first place designs for all of the house competitions. The gallery illustrations signify the body of architects in that the designs stand for architects who've been forgotten and the designs represent the competitor's body of work. A large biographical section of all of the winners and losers and your winners completes the book. Carpentry and Buildings competitions promoted comparative design work among designers who were geographically distant from one another, and it also sponsored several competitions based on cooperative efforts toward one product. One such interactive device consisted of a, consisted of a four-phase competition in which designers piggybacked on the design of another. An 1882 contest called for a floor plan for a seven-room house. The winning set of plan drawings by Beers was subsequently used as the basis for the next competition in elevation and details, won by Grotevant. In turn, the winning elevation drawings became the basis for a third competitive phase, the submission of specifications for materials, followed by yet another competition for cost estimates. Through the course of four successive competitions, which ran for over a year in the, in the journal, four individual designers from four different states provided carpentry and building with a full set of construction drawings for a single house. Carpentry and building produced floor plan competitions that were unique in their own right. The paper published 10 to 15 of the best plans that it received 
and ask the readership to vote by mail ballot for their first choice. You're looking at a page from the paper illustrating the plans of designers number 208 and 29. On a numerical basis of the ballots, Carpentry and Building awarded first, second, and third place prizes. Asking subscribers to vote engaged the reading community in a critical dialogue with each other that contributed to formalizing interior planning principles. Analyzing the floor plan competitions in particular relied on intelligent comparison. This proved especially difficult because the plans possessed more similarities than differences. A designer learned how to examine all the nuances of all three floors of each plan before comparing it to another. In this process, a reader came to a conclusion about the, the superiority of one design over another. Empowered by his decision, each reader cast his vote for his choice. From the beginning, the competitions gained an outstanding reputation. In a flurry of good fortune, Carpentry and Building's first two competitions attracted college-educated and highly competent architects. Each of the winning firms included a graduate from Cornell University's architecture program. These competitors legitimized the contest for recognized architects, but the competition procedures and carpentry and building straightforward criticism also encouraged the professional aspiration of others. The competitions cross a big landscape and introduce many characters. Some individuals become familiar as I follow five Eastern architects, Monty Fuller, Montezuma Fuller, pictured here in his office, Fred Hale, Eugene Rice, Frank Grotevin, and Morris Stuckert on westward trajectories to Colorado and beyond. In 1907, the American architect stated that to procure work and consequent fame, one of the surest ways for a patient man was to settle in a new and promising community and grow up in it. That sentiment surely motivated Monty Fuller. In 1880, Fuller, a 22-year-old, arrived in Fort Collins, Colorado, when the town was less than 20 years old. His family describes that first year as a very lean one. <coughs> Fred Hale, with a partner, won first prize in the first competition. He's illustrated here with his wife, Minnie, from uh, Rochester, and the Alta Club he designed in Salt Lake City. After completing high school in Rochester, Hale won a scholarship to attend Cornell's program in architecture. In 1880, he became one of 10 architects in Denver. He joined the office of Robert S. Rochelov as his chief draftsman. Rochelov was one of Denver's most prominent architects, and he took on a young graduate of the Cornell School, and I'm quoting, because he had shown distinction in his education by winning a competition sponsored by Carpentry and Building Magazine. In this account, Hale's competition win meant more than his Cornell education. Another New York State native, Eugene Rice, arrived in Denver in 1881, bringing the total number of architects to 19. In 1886, Rice entered a 10-year partnership with his partner, Robert uh, Balcom, who was a carpenter. Rice won second place in $750 frame house and first place in $1,000 frame houses. The most mobile architect in Carpentry and Building's publication history was Frank Grotevet. Carpentry and Building chronicled his migration from Syracuse, where he apprenticed and later partnered with an established architect, to Leavenworth and Wichita, Kansas, and on to Denver. Gardevin arrived in Colorado as a civilian architect with the U.S. Army. He designed all of Fort Logan's buildings. During his 39-year career with the Army, he supervised construction of six military posts in Montana, Oregon, Wyoming, Georgia, and the Philippine <coughs> Islands, where, he's, where, he, where he is pictured here second from the left. 
1888, another New York State native, Morris Stuckert, followed Fuller, Hale, Rice, and Grotebeck in migrating from the Northeast. Unlike the motives of his peers, however, Stuckert turned his sights west because of failing health. 29-year-old Stuckert began his Denver practice by establishing a branch office in Pueblo, Colorado. By the time Stuckert migrated west, he had established himself as a residential architect in Newark and the Oranges, and his designs were published nationally in nationally distributed magazines. Of the five Western architects established here today, Stuckert and Fuller had the least training, learning the carpentry trade first, drafting second. Grotevin's background represented the still viable mode of apprenticeship with the leading architect. 37% of the competition winners were builders who trained in a trade, learned to draft, and passed into professional ranks. 34% of the winners apprenticed themselves as drafters with a mentor architect. 15% of carpentry and builders, builder buildings, winners chosen education through the correspondence or technical schools. Correspondence schools pioneered simplified methods of mass vocational training and attracted students in great numbers. Their success depended on advertising, market proficiency, and the public's increasing association of specialized skills with middle class status. Of the correspondence schools, at least 10 winners and four year winners chose the International Correspondence School, ICS, founded in 1891 in Scranton, Pennsylvania. ICS's print advertisements included testimonials like the one of M.P. Kellogg, as well as appeals to increase earning power. Although Kellogg claimed to be a competition winner in his testimonial, he did not win any carpentry and building contest. A university education was attained or claimed by 16% of the winners. The nation's first academic programs in architecture at MIT, Cornell, and the University of Illinois offered the status of a university degree. Three years after Cornell opened, the trustees founded the first four-year course in architecture at an American university. Despite the library endowments at leading schools of architecture, the shelves of Columbia, Cornell, MIT, Harvard, Penn State, the University of Illinois, and Yale also exhibited international correspondence schools textbooks uh, as reference books. Of the carpentry and buildings winners who claim they took courses or graduated from a university, half attended Cornell in the late 19th century. Augustus Howe and Eric Rossiter enrolled in the first class in 1871 and comprised two of architecture's four graduates in 1875. Fred Hale graduated in 1876 in a class of six and F.A. Wright in 1879 in a class of four. Cornell's dominance among carpentry and buildings winners may have resided in the pragmatism of its curriculum. Charles Babcock, the pro program's first director, made professional independence his goal, emphasizing the art of building in order that graduates could at once get employment. Denver architect Eugene Rice claimed a Cornell education. The 1892 biographical account of Balcom and Rice stated that Rice prepared himself for the practice of architecture in the department of Cornell University. Biographies of this type were often vanity publications, that is, the biographical information was either obtained from or written by the subject. Rice's account makes a broad reference to his Cornell connections, but in all subsequent printed references, he's credited as studying at Cornell. Cornell's records, however, indicate that he never registered as a full-time student or special student. If Rice pretended a Cornell education and did not have one, 
he may have found himself in uncomfortable circumstances in Denver where Fred Hale practiced and Ezra Cornell's nephew drafted. ICS attempted to compensate for its lack of college experience by offering students school jewelry, matching in style, if not in sentiment, an insignia worn by a Cornell University student in the 1871 to 1875 period when Rossiter, Hale, and Howe attended. Both objects are frozen in time. <clears throat> One cherished, the patch resides in the university's archive, the other discarded, I bought it on eBay. <laughs> the story of architectural experience in America cannot neatly be described in a linear progression from unskilled to professional, from constricted into expanded opportunities. Although most 19th century architects maintained an individual practice, seven sets of partners won the competitions. Among the winners who graduated from Cornell, four opted to initiate their professional practice by forming partnerships, entering design competitions, and publishing designs in builders' magazines. Monty Fuller on the left began <clears throat> excuse me, a family dynasty in which he became the first architect and succeeding generations followed linearly. In the Fuller line, Monty was the only one who became an architect from the ground up. In 1906, second son, Robert Kay, on the right in this photograph, freshly graduated from Colorado Agricultural College with a BS in Mechanical Engineering, joined Monty as M.W. Fuller and son. After only a year in his father's office, Robert left Fort Collins to study at Cornell graduating in 1908 with a BA in architecture. In 1909, father and son entered into a second partnership agreement, but in 1910, Robert left to work in Denver. <laughs> with two degrees under his belt, perhaps Robert wanted recognition other than son in his father's practice. Two of Monty Fuller's grandsons became architects, Monty's level, you see here, with tripod, rod, and case, remains a useful tool, not an artifact, to his great-grandson, Robert K. Fuller II, an architect currently in practice in Denver. He still uses it. Drawing for publication emerges as a significant fact and a vital part of practice for many of the competitors. Extending into the 20th century, the tradition of architectural books as a source of natural architectural culture. Over half of the competitors, including winners and losers, published designs in trade magazines. This was a surprise to me. Nine wrote books, and more than a quarter of the competitors had their designs included in books. John Kingston's entire family firm, John, George, Laura, and Charles, had designs published. Education and training was not a factor in those who did publish. The architect's role transformed design into a marketable commodity, giving the pressure, uh, impression of architecture as just one more consumer project, product excuse me, for an expanding middle class. The most audacious advertisement among the competitors came from a near winner in the 1886 moderate price frame dwellings. Whether from national pride or a marketing ploy, the firm's advertisement capitalized on a large German-speaking population in San Diego. This 1899 advertisement for the business of Warren Brothers in West Liberty, Iowa, illustrates why the American Institute of Architects dis disapproved of advertising as unprofessional. Warren's advertisement featured Mrs. Warren's dress decorated with a grill pattern similar to the one he crafted for his private residence. The sleeves, hem, and hat were adorned with shavings from a hand plane. Although conviviality had nothing to do with competency, personal links were the most legitimate way to obtain a clientele to obtain clientele. 
Most architects handed out business card and placed small display advertisements like the one for Balcom and Rice in city uh, directories. In the business of architecture, Hale earned the most money of the Western winners, but Charles Insco Williams of Dayton, Ohio outdid Hale. Williams made a noteworthy start at business by winning in 1884 first place in the $1,500 house competition and by capturing big building commissions, including churches, city clubs, hotels, schools, apartment buildings, and Dayton's first skyscraper. Dayton newspapers recounted Charles and Susan's, Susan Boyer Williams' participation as part of Dayton's high society. By 1910, Williams had built a mansion, retained a chauffeur, and invested in durable goods, including a six-carat diamond ring. It's not on record whether it's for him or for Susan. <laughs> Williams earned a large fortune in Dayton by developing and mortgaging a completed building to finance the next one so that he could retain ownership. This strategy worked well until a flood in 1913 damaged many of his buildings. During the lengthy cleanup period, he lost both tenants and income. Eventually, a savings and loan association foreclosed on his loans, and in 1919, the Williams suffered the humiliation of a sheriff's foreclosure that sold their mansion and all of the goods in it. A family friend bought the home and allowed the Williams to continue living in it, but by 1922, they could no longer afford the upkeep. Williams died in 1923, his wife a year later. They lived their last years in the home of Williams' sister. Other stories are unraveled in the book, including under-recognized or important architects. Consider the ignoble fate of competition winner John Weiss. During the American Depression of the 1930s, Weiss's descendants washed his original linen, linen drawings of St. Louis designs until they became suitable for dish towels. Of the ideas and ideals that permeated domestic architecture and gave shape to carpentry and building and its competitions, one of the oldest and most significant paradigms was the separation of the exterior from the interior rhetorically as distinct zones requiring opposing values and differing treatments. The phrasing includes more cases that can easily be recovered for you today, but I've given you two examples of its development, one in the 18th century, the other in the mid-19th century. This rhetoric of differentiation between inside and outside transpired regardless of stylistic, stylistic or typological designations, urban or rural locations, rich or poor clientele. Distancing the exterior from the interior allowed for stylistic treatments for the outside, and it made way for an entirely different theoretical treatment for the inside. Drawing practices also helped to extend the division between inside and out. Builders' trade papers, pattern books, and plan books had, since the middle of the 19th century, irrevocably linked the perspective drawing of an exterior and a plan drawing. Together, these two drawings stood as a substitution for a whole house, enabling part to stand for whole. It was not only enough, but all that was necessary to evaluate a house design and American men and women were quite accustomed to making consumer choices based on this strategy. The term convenient arrangement was used with such frequency in 18th and 19th century architectural papers, women's advice books, and as a measure of interior planning in the carpentry and building contest that I endeavored to find out what it meant. Defining it and fleshing out its principles became the central interpretation of the book. Convenient arrangement is an interior-centered philosophy that had a long history by the time the competitions began extrapolating 
those principles for 19th century architects. Consider thinking about the theory of convenient arrangement as a dough requiring various ingredients and a yeast to make it rise. Making bread requires the right amount and kind of ingredients, the mixing of those parts, the kneading and shaping to make it into a recognizable loaf. Baking at an appropriate temperature prepares it for eating, for anyone to slice. This analogy is particularly domestic, even humble, because house design was quite different than other kinds of architecture. The ingredients included all those precedents about building an internal arrangement passed down from, from Vitruvius to Palladio through the Renaissance to French and English architects. It included the mixing in of English and American women's knowledge and advice about the household and its relationship to the plan. The yeast that made convenient arrangement rise was social and cultural encompassing Americans' desires to own single-family houses in the country and the suburbs. Other ingredients, such as agricultural reform and scientific facts about a healthy home, found their way into the mix. Carpentry and buildings competitions helped knead and shape convenient arrangement into standards that were transformed into a variety of plans and spatial forms. The recipe was tried over and over with variations and was disseminated widely. But no loaf was ever truly the same because architects and women and Americans in general continued to experiment with the recipe or the process, sometimes modifying it and at other times changing it almost to the point of non-recognition. The competitions tell the stories of some of those trials. Convenient arrangement had only one mode of representation, the plan. The history of convenient arrangement is essentially a history of the plan. As the domestic interior became more important than the exterior, the plan evolved as the interior's most significant architectural drawing. The plan drawing provided the means to read interior architecture and design principles, such as proper circulation. Carpentry and buildings floor plan competitions became the bully pulpit for criticizing interior planning principles. The progressive contest of 1882 and 1883 amplified the notion that the interior and exterior operated as parallel entities. As an ideal plan remained static, various materials and stylistic variations could be wrapped around it. Carpentry and Building's 1902 competition for a modern farmhouse coincided with the year that Martha Van Rensselaer Cornell initiated the farmhouse series in the home reading courses for farm wives. In this illustration, Monty Fuller delineated his design for a farmhouse foundation into useful production rooms. Principles for proper house design now taken for granted were then not codified by designers and carpentry and building focused on the floor plan as the means to achieve proper internal planning. Poor planning in the form of inefficient circulation became fodder for criticism. In 1882, the editor poked fun at plans from a competitor who displayed a 17 foot by 17 foot kitchen with 11 doors and windows and another entrant who showed an exterior door for every first floor room. The paper's fault finding advocated the reduction of doors in rooms so they would not cut, be cut into by numerous pathways. The paper also validated another circulation principle. To compel the occupants of the house to pass through one room in order to get into another is a clumsy mistake. In the 1882 floor plan competition, B.C. Pond's use of canted walls in this plan resulted in a spatially distinct dining room. Two walls of the sitting room received angled walls, leaving the other side unbalanced. Three canted fireplaces, an angled stair, piazza seat, and bay window resulted in a dizzy interpretation of picturesque effects. Pond placed in the top ten, but failed to win a prize. 
Impressionistically, the picturesque cottage could not have been more inappropriate for a coupling with the theory of convenient arrangement. Convenience embodied values such as plainness, compactness, functionality, and carpentry and buildings seemingly compounded the problem by creating competitions for inexpensive houses. The cottage depended on additive, additive effects and spaces, as well as other elements which drove cost higher. The footprint schematic on the left of some of the competition's um, winning designs and a cottage's roof plan on the right demonstrate that the picturesque aesthetic, the cottage, and convenient arrangement appear to contradict. Yet read in a broader context of design theory, they were extraordinarily compatible. The form accommodating design from the inside out. The tenets of convenient arrangement required that the interior be designed first, creating flexible, organic plans from which the exterior could form naturally. Analytical drawings advance principles of convenient arrangement. The functional diagram as an architectural drawing emerges in 19th century advice books, stemming directly from the need to represent convenient arrangement in visual format. Kerr's 1877 figure, drown, figure ground drawing on the left, called a thoroughfare plan, is one of the most remarkable analysis studies of convenient arrangement. In this drawing, rooms are cross-hatched, allowing the white spaces for circulation pathways to become more visible. Charles Osborne, who became the second appointment in Cornell's architecture program in 1881, compared a house plan to an anatomy, with thoroughfares as the skeletal system. His functional drawing on the right subdivided the entrance into three component parts. In his chapter devoted to circulation, he used diagrams and plan view to explain multiple relationships and room adjacency principles. Comparative illustrations also taught the principles of convenient arrangement by illustrating good and bad designs. In 1877, Calvert Box used comparative plan drawings to illustrate two ways of treating the entry of a one-room house. In figure one, the door opens directly into the room opposite the fireplace, creating a cold draft. Further, the sink and bed were exposed in view, making cleanliness and privacy scarcely possible. Box's recommended plan in figure two creates an interior architecture with a living room, a small entry space that doubled as a sink room, a recess for the bed, and a built-in window seat with closets. When the competitions ended in 1909, convenient arrangement claimed several constituents. Housewives, professional home economists, architects, and builders. In 1910, and at Cornell, the theory of convenient arrangement was moved forward by Helen Binkard Young. Helen Binkard in the dark dress, second row, graduated in 1900 from Cornell with a Bachelor's of Architecture degree. And in 1902, she married a classmate, George Young, who began teaching in the architecture department. In 1910, Young crossed the quadrangle that lay between architecture and agriculture and asked Van Rensselaer if she could teach for a year or two without salary in the burgeoning Department of Home Economics. Van Rensselaer agreed, and Young found her calling. Between 1911 and 1916, Young wrote five bulletins about the interior for the reading courses for farmers' wives, in which she disseminated concepts about convenience, making good use of comparative drawings like those of Vox. From architecture, Young also brought the Beaux-Arts principles to convenient arrangement, thus contributing to making design principles rather than decoration or taste, a basis for convenience. In the 20th century, Binkard Young and Cornell home economist refined convenience as the basis for the scientific study of interiors. The historical mindset of different spheres for outside and inside allowed for the specialization and eventually 
the professionalization of interior designers in the 20th century. In the final analysis, carpentry and buildings disinterest and oftentimes a distaste about exterior style as a form of pretentiousness spoke to its ideals. Nothing about the visual nature of a dwelling could be as important as its interior arrangement. Carpentry and building favored typology. The paper faced an uphill battle because style as a major construct was well established when the competitions began and it became more embedded over time. Today that bias is perpetuated by the National Register of Historic Places, which persists in requiring stylistic nomenclature for all nominated buildings, regardless of their origins, construction, or design intentions. The history of the plan and the theory of convenient arrangement constitute the best argument why vernacular architecture should be interpreted from the interior and by typology, as well as by exterior appearance and style. Thank you.